sing about this morning, our God is the God of all glory. Hallelujah. In fact, that's what our theology class is about tonight. Chapter 5, in the first three studies, we went pretty fast because it was more like preliminary. At least the first couple of chapters were about how do we get in this mess and then you'll postmodern and modern thought. And then the last couple of studies, we've looked at Revelation, God revealing himself in nature. And then last week, how we got our body. But tonight, we get into the nature of Almighty God. I look forward to that. If you have your Bible with you this morning, I certainly hope that you do. Please open up with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we'll begin in verse 17 in just a minute. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we'll begin in verse 17 in just a few minutes. Okay, so... Last week we started on this uh, on 1 Corinthians and we looked at saints should be united. <coughs> then we introduced the, the letter, first Corinthians, the letter of 1 Corinthians. You know, we know more about the Corinthian church than any other church because Paul wrote two letters to it, pretty large letters. The, book of, uh, the letter to the Romans may be a little larger, but it's only one. We have two pretty large letters written to the Corinthians. We talked about how immoral the society was. All the idols, all the prostitution, sexual sins, uh, just rampant. It, it was a port city. In fact, it had the same, it's only four miles wide, the Isthmus is, but it had two port cities, one on each side of the... So it, it's, it's a lot of travel on the main commerce roads of the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire before that. And it's a church full of problems. If you have your outline, if you didn't, please pick one up. I, I don't know what color they are, but mine's white because of... Yellow. I don't know. It's just I, I take the yeah, kind of yellow coat. I take the ones that don't come out quite right. And that's the ones I use. But uh, so uh, we looked at uh, the, the calling to sainthood. We talked about the benefits of being of being a saint of God, and we actually got into that first problem. That first problem takes up the first four chapters: divisions in the church, and then he tells us about lots of other problems: defilement in the church. Chapter, can you believe there's a man in the church? living openly with his stepmother in sexual sin. Then they have lawsuits against each other. There's more sexual sins. And then the fifth problem is they don't even know how to conduct their own marriages. Liberty. Oh, you can read it. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a letter written about nine big church problems. And uh, Paul's writing to them about God's will for these things. Okay, so, so man, that's a tough church, yes. And yet it's the church that, that, that Paul says this to I want to present you as a chaste virgin before Almighty God. You know why? Because he was confident that they could repent of their sins. He was confident that they were in Jesus Christ, that, that they knew about the cross of Jesus Christ. So he prayed for them. So, but he still had to deal with these problems. Some people act like, well, we don't need to deal with church problems. Yes, we do. And so he's, after he talked about let's let's just look a little bit here. A couple of things. Last week we talked about how good that grace is. In verse, in verse 3, the grace of God, how that God saves us, we don't deserve it at all. And because of that, it, this really blows Baptist mind. A lot of people don't like this when I say this, but you don't owe God anything for your salvation. Because you couldn't pay for it. <laughs> it's all God's grace. God paid for your sins so that you don't have to die and go to hell. You do not have to die and go to hell forever. Then, he talked about in verse 6 and verse 8 how the weak were confirmed. That's a legal term. Paul was a very well-educated man. And he says that this, we are confirmed presently in Christ. And in verse 8 it says, Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's confident of that. Why? Because verse 9, God is faithful. Then we started on the first problem, which has five smaller problems under it if you look at your outline. The first problem is about church division. The first error in that is that they are following men. I am of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. They have all these people there of. And Paul said, did I die for you? Was I crucified? Were you baptized unto my name? No, you're not. How foolish. Now he's still going on with this problem of division. We'll start in this today. The second problem uh, that they have in division is that they... Think that worldly wisdom, that worldly wisdom can, can take care of their problems. That's why the title of the message is The Foolishness of the Cross. 
the wisdom and true power of God. But we'll start in this problem today. It goes all the way through the end of chapter 2. But we'll start it today. And we'll see these, these things here. The cross is God's plan. It's superior wisdom of the cross. Verse 17 and 18. God's wisdom will prevail. It will last. The wisdom of men will fail. All the power of men will fail. All the governments of men will fail. God's wisdom has power. Verse 21 through verse 25. God's wisdom has a purpose. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at that as we, as we go through today. That God does not want us to be divided over human leaders. God does not want us to be divided over earthly wisdom. <clears throat> we need to be turning our hearts to God. Now I'm going to read several verses <clears throat> before we pray this morning. So you'll get a little taste of, of the songs that we sung today about the glory of God. The, the, the gloriousness of God, the greatness of God, and God's plan to save you from hell. Let's read verse 17. We'll go all the way through verse 25, and then we'll go back and start through it. And we'll, we'll cover more verses than that, Lord's will. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach. Now that's where we stopped at last week. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. <laughs> not with the wisdom of words, that is not with fancy speech, not with, even though Paul was a trained orator, he had a great education. In fact, he, he says in the to the Corinthian church later, I speak many languages. He, he was a man that just has so many, he was so gifted even before he got saved, he was so well educated. Let, I do not preach with the wisdom of words. Why? Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Here's another one of those Greek words you know. The Greek word is moronic. You know what moronic means? It's the same thing it still means today, right? Somebody that's foolish and doesn't have any, somebody you feel sorry for, doesn't have good sense. Preaching of the cross is to them that perish is moronic. But to those of us that are saved, it is the power of God. I love that word saved. I can say that a thousand times. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. Saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Saved from who I was. And saved who I want to be. Saved from hell. Hell is saved for heaven. Saved. The saved. Salvation. The power of God. For it is written, Isaiah chapter 29, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the proved. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer? Or your Bible may say uh, debater. <laughs> The doubter of this world. Now it's, it's, it's not. You'll see the word "world" three times here, but this this first time it's not this. It's the word. It's not the same. It means where's the disputer or the doubter of this age? And we live in a modern age. Do you hear people call it that sometimes? We live in a modern age, the age of convenience. Well, the Roman world at Corinth was a modern age. They had a lot of conveniences that the rest of the Roman world didn't have because of its wealth. In fact, they had that that again uh, games there every other year. The the Greeks love sporting events. Uh, we still have revised one of them. We still call it today the Olympic Games, the Olympian Games. That was one of the great sporting events of uh, of, the, of of the Greeks. But the other one was the Isthmus Games, which was held in Corinth. So every other year, one year they'd have the Olympic Games, next year they'd have the Isthmus Games. They had all these things. Where is the disputer of this age? Hath God not made the the full it made foolish the wisdom of this world, and this time it's different. It means the world system. Has God not made foolishness of the world system? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world—that's the same. The world system—that's another Greek word, you know, cosmos. The cosmos. As for after the, in the wisdom of God, the cosmos by wisdom knew not God. In spite of all the wisdom they had, they could not know God. In spite of all the Greek philosophers and all the Roman might of the army, they could not know God. But there is a way to know God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness, there's the word again, moronic, but to them that are, which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, 
and the wisdom of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God, just think about it, even if you just took one bee at the one tree at the one drop of God's power, it'd still be stronger than man. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let's bow our heads together for prayer this morning. Father, I pray as we look at your word this morning, we focus our attention on the cross of Jesus Christ, the true power of God. Greatest power this world's ever known, much more powerful than any atomic bomb or hydrogen bomb or any kind of destruction that mankind has. The power of the cross can redeem men's souls from hell. Father, I pray today that you would help us to, as believers to see your glory today. Your glory, your power, your majesty and the cross of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray, please hide me behind the cross today that we would see Jesus. We lift up his holy name. Christ said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. So Father, I pray today that we'll lift up Jesus. If there's any here that don't know Christ the Savior, today would be their day to have their sins washed away. And Lord, if there are those of us that are believers, be strengthened to say we want to be more holy. We want to live closer to Jesus. We want to be more like Him and less like ourselves. Father, we thank You for what we're about to receive from Your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. The question is this, are you willing to admit that you're not strong enough, you're not smart enough, you're not wise enough to save yourself? Amen. If you're willing to do that, you're on the first plan, first part. You've got the first part down. You cannot save yourself. You can turn to God and He can wash your sins away. And those of us that are believers, to remember we did not save ourselves. Okay, let's just dig right on into it this morning. The first point, the cross... God's superior wisdom, verse 17 and 18. He said, I came preaching the gospel not, not with the uh, wisdom of, of words, not with enticing words, with all of his orator skills. Why? Because he wanted the cross to be of effect. You say, well, how could the cross ever be of none effect? Well, on the outline you'll see, the only way the cross could be of none effect if we put Jesus behind us. If we put Jesus behind us, then the cross has no power. <coughs> but the wisdom of God is superior to all philosophy, all religion. Remember who Paul was writing this. He was, he was a, a scribe. He was a Pharisee. He knew the Word of God. He was an educated man. He was a Roman citizen. All these things, education, are not superior to the wisdom of the cross. If our words or our speech, we think that we can talk somebody into being saved, I guarantee you, somebody else can talk them out of being saved. It must be the power of God that draws them. The cross has power. It reminds me of an illustration I read probably about 30 years ago from Dr. Warren Wiersbe. This little five-year-old girl sitting with her mom in church like you guys said today. Behind the pastor, there was this big stained glass window. I love our stained glass windows. Got pictures of Christ and different things in his life. Well, this one had the picture that we have right here beside of Sister Cheryl. It was Christ hanging on the cross right behind the pastor. He was a really tall man. She's a little five-year-old looking up at an angle. And they have a guest speaker that day. And he's a little short guy. And she's watching the preacher preach. And her mom's amazed by how tight she's holding on to the preacher. That's what her mom thinks of. And then she pulls her arm and says, Mom, Mom. Where's the other guy that usually stands there that hides Jesus? <laughs> well, I hope we don't ever hide Jesus. That, that stuck in my mind 30 or more years ago. We should never hide Jesus when we talk about Him. Don't try to be slick and say, I want to tell you about all this and all that and this and that. No. We are not to hide Jesus. We are to very boldly and very clearly tell people that Jesus Christ is the answer. Don't be ashamed. Remember what it says over in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is a power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and then also to the Greek. That's us, to Gentiles. So the power of God is not in slick words, but it's in the cross of Jesus Christ. Verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish 
if you have a different translation, it may be a little better than King James on this one, where it says, are perishing. You are perishing if you don't know Jesus Christ. You say, I thought I'd perish someday when I went to hell. No. Nope. You're perishing right now. You're dead and you're trespassing the sins. Right now, you are perishing. You're away from God. You're not following Him. To those that are perishing, it is foolishness. It's, it's, it's stupidity. It's moronic. But it's us that are, here's again, the same linear word, those of us who are being saved. You say, I thought I was already saved. You are. Wait, wait, wait. Don't worry. But you are being saved too. And you see that, don't you? Amen. Yeah, I, look, so I just want to put your mind at least. So I looked at some Bible verses for you. Romans chapter 8, verse 24 says, We are saved by the hope of God. That's present tense. Here it says we're being saved. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, We shall be saved by His blood. Well, you know what? That's all true. We were saved at a definite point in time when we asked Christ to wash our sins away. And I hope that's just as real to you that day as it was 20, 50, 60 years ago, two years ago, one year. Whenever you came to know Christ as Savior, it's just as real to you today that you are being saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I love that. Day by day. Day by day. The, the Sunday school lesson this morning, Brother Ray, when he had us read our, do our congregational reading this morning before Sunday school class, said that if we confess our sins, and that's written to Christians, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. I like that. Okay, so, preaching of the cross will save mankind by its power. The power of God. The power of God. Here the word is, it's just a lot of Greek words you guys know today. The, the word power here is where we get our English word dynamite. The dynamite of God. God's dynamite power is the cross of Jesus Christ. Okay, going on now. Second point here. God's wisdom will endure. It will prevail. It will last. It will, will not end. Okay. Verse, verse 18 and uh, verse 19 and 20. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. That's Isaiah chapter 29. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. It's the Lord's will. Where is the wise? Now, I'm going to explain this as we go. Where is the wise? The wise, that's uh, the Greek philosophers. In fact, uh, I have a little note here. Uh, Aristotle said this, uh, excuse me, Aristotle said this. On every street corner in Corinth, there was a so-called wise man that had his own solution to the world problems. Now, I will slide my glasses out here. Do y'all know anybody in West Virginia that's got all the problems to all the world? You can't even talk to them. They know everything. You don't know anything. They're the wise. You're not the wise. They know everything. Well, that's what that has not changed. The wise think they know everything. Where is the wise? Well, the answer is nowhere. God's put them to shame. Where's the scribe? Where's the Jewish scribe that, that wrote the law of God? Where's that, that's Paul. Paul was one of those guys. Paul was a guy that was uh, a Pharisee, so well educated, a student of Gamaliel. Gamaliel you remember? We read in the book of Acts. It mentions. His teacher's name. All these things. A Roman citizen. He had all the privileges that anybody could have. Paul did. He was high born, so to speak. But you know, there was a day on the road to Damascus. And Paul had authority, power, real power, from all the Roman, all the Jewish officials to put people in jail that called on the name of Jesus. And he's going down to Damascus to put more men and women, especially says it, and women in prison. If they would not curse the name of Jesus, blaspheme the name of Jesus. But then he meets the Savior. He meets the power of God. And from that time forward, he knew the real power. Where is the scribe? I tell you what, he's nowhere. Where is the disputer or the, uh, the disagreer, the, the debater, the doubter of this age? He's nowhere. That's where he is. There's no power. All that will pass. He, I thought this was hilarious. Debbie and I went to Israel about eight or nine years ago, and when we did, we are going through all these Roman ruins. Rome was the greatest power prophesied in the Old Testament, the greatness of the Roman Empire. But Rome has long since fell. And we're going through all these Roman ruins led by Jewish Tory gods. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how the mighty have fallen. You know what, guys? They all have fallen. One power after another power. They're nothing. Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of all this world system of the cosmos? He has. 
So let's go back to as it's written. Because that's a good story. Paul's reminded all the Jewish <coughs> Jews and all the Jewish Christians in, in Corinth would, would know this so they could share it with the other Corinthians. Is it not written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the proof? One of the coolest stories in the Bible. When I start with it, you're going to know it by heart. You say, I've heard this story a billion times. <coughs> it's just this story. Isaiah writes that to them because King Hezekiah and all of his wise men have heard that Sennacherib, the, the mighty king of the Syrians, is coming down to invade their land. So they make an agreement with Egypt. Though God says, do not go to Egypt. Said it in his word. But then he sends out Jeremiah. Jeremiah comes and looks at the king. Do not go down to Egypt to find your, your, your security. Well, what happens is they sign a big security agreement with, with Egypt to protect them from uh, Assyria. And then, so the Sennacherib bypasses Israel and goes down and whoops the whoops, Egyptian back into place. Oh no, now their best buddy, the they're, they're one they're dependent on, which Jeremiah's funny, says you're dependent on Isaiah, I mean, says you're, I mean Isaiah, you fall, you're like to bleed on a smoking reed, you want to punch right through your hand. And so they get there, and the army surrounds them. Over 200,000 men surrounding the little city of Jerusalem. Finally, Isaiah gets through to Hezekiah. It's so good. It's reported. It's already it's recorded not just in Isaiah, but also in Kings. I mean, uh, Chronicles. It's a great story. What happens next? Hezekiah goes and prays. You remember this story, don't you? And that not one angel. Now, he had all the angels of heaven to depend on, but he chose to depend on the Egyptians. One angel goes through the host of the, of the, of, of the Syrian army and kills 185,000 of them in one night. No, not in a plague over months. <laughs> one night, he kills 185,000 of them and Sennacherib says, maybe we better not fool with this city. They're, they got a real God. We better pack up and go home. You know what, guys? That's who you can depend on. Don't depend on Egypt. Don't depend on your own knowledge. I love that story. It's one of my favorite stories as a kid because I always like those war stories, fighting stories. And, and God just sent his blessings. And God, one angel, just one angel, sent and killed all those Assyrians. There's only enough of them left to pack up and tail, run with tails between their legs and run back to Assyria. Why? Because King Hezekiah depended on God and God's power, not the wisdom of men. Amen. Hallelujah! <laughs> the wisdom of God will last even though everything else will fail. Point number three. God's wisdom has power. Verse 21 through verse 25. And we read this already this morning, so I'm just going to take us through. Verse 21 actually sums up, states what verse 17 through verse 20 has been getting at. We've been leading up to. That all wisdom has failed to know God. For after the wisdom, for after the, in the wisdom of God, the world, the whole cosmos, by wisdom, knew not God. No matter how great Plato was, no matter how great Aristotle was, no matter how great the, that, that all the religions of the world are, they cannot know God. Now, this is where you need to pull your big boy britches up, your big girl britches up, whatever. And you need to say this right here. I'm going to quit being afraid to tell people about Jesus. Amen. Let me tell you what. You better, you better quit being ashamed when, when they start saying, I'm going to get to heaven through Jehovah's Witnesses. No, you're not. Hey, I'm gonna get to heaven as being a. Uh, I'm gonna get to heaven by being a Muslim. No, you're not. But but, but, I, but you. But I, oh, I know some good Muslims too. Long life. I've, I've known some good ones. I've known some some good Jehovah Witnesses. I've, I have even known a few Mormons. I thought were really. You couldn't ask for better neighbors than Mormons. They're clean as pins. They're not. But you know what? They preach that Jesus is not the only Son of God. You know where they're going? They're going to hell. Because there's one way to heaven. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me say that again. There's one way to heaven, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Right. You say, but, but, but what about how good that the Hindu, some Hindus are? Or Buddhists that live in peace? They'll live in peace and be in hell forever and ever and ever. Because Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to pay for our sins. <clears throat> God's wisdom has power. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world, by wisdom, knew not God. Here's something amazing. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. We can believe because we're persons. Jesus did not die to save angels. All the angels that fell from the first estate will be in hell forever and ever and ever. 
God, he didn't die to save animals. Jesus Christ died to save human beings. He came as a man and lived among us, lived a sinless life, died on the cross of Calvary so that we can make heaven our home. He paid the price we could never pay as he hung on the cross of Calvary. Amen. And because you're a person, you can believe. You have a free will to believe as a person that you can be saved. Trust and repent of your sins. Trust Jesus Christ on the cross to wash your sins away. It pleased God. Literally, I, I, I looked that up in the Greek because I wasn't sure about that word. It literally means gave God pleasure. God takes pleasure in saving. God's glory is in saving us from hell. You say, I thought God saved me because I was so good. That's what your mama told you. <laughs> you see, she don't even believe it. She just tells you that, okay? Let me tell you guys. Let me tell you guys. God didn't save you because you was good enough to go to heaven. God saved you for his own good pleasure because it pleases God. I don't even understand how. I don't understand. We're going to talk about the nature of God tonight. We'll be blown away. But let me tell you what. The glory of God, the vastness of God, for his own pleasure, God the Son died for you. How could it be pleasure for him to be nailed on a tree, to be beaten till his bowels were coming out? How could it that be pleasure? Because he knew what to say in the book of Hebrews. The author and finisher of our faith, despising the shame of the cross, but looking forward to what it accomplished. He died in your place. He died in my place. Hallelujah. He died in our place. And it pleased God to do that. For the Jews require a sign. They always did. I'm going to go through this quickly. They, they always required a sign. When Jesus was on earth, they said, show us a sign, Messiah. That's what Christ means. It's, just, it's, the, it's the Greek word for the Jewish word, Messiah. Uh, he's the Christ, the Messiah, the Messiah of the Jews. The Jews required a sign. So show us a sign like, remember the Pharisees and scribes said this many times, show us a sign like Moses did, like Elijah did. And Jesus said, I'll give you a sign. The sign will be the sign of Jonah the prophet. As he is in the belly of the well for three days, so will the Son of Man be in the earth and he will raise again. An empty tomb is the sign. A bloody cross where he paid. You know what the tomb is for? The tomb is paid for our sins. He died on the cross of Calvary to pay for our sins. But the tomb, the empty tomb, is proof that he has power over death, Amen. hell, and the grave. <laughs> My goodness! Did you? He has power and we don't have to die. He died in our place. We won't go to hell because he's already paid the price to the Father. Paid for our sins. Hallelujah. Washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. They want to sign. The sign is an empty tomb. The G Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block. There's another Greek word. You know that all kind of, that's the word skandalos. You know what the Greek word skandalos means? The same one thing that scandal means today. It's messed up. It's messed up. The Jews were expecting the Messiah to come. And to conquer the Romans. And to set up his kingdom. And he will, by the way. Read, read about that in the book of Revelation. He will set up his kingdom right here on this earth. And Moscow will not be the leading city. London, uh, New York, uh, uh, Beijing, uh, uh, Washington, D.C. Jerusalem. He will set up his kingdom. So they were expecting that. And for you to look, could you imagine trying to, as Paul, trying to talk to a first century Jew and say, the Messiah came. <gasps> they get excited. And he was nailed on the cross. You walk away. You say, you're an idiot. How could the Messiah die? He's the Messiah. Because he is the Messiah. Only he could die for your sins. Only the sinless one. You see, sin demands an eternal punishment. So you can pay for your sins by dying and going to hell. Listen to me. Any of y'all listen to this online today? You can die and go to hell forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. And you'll never pay for your sins. You say, but I haven't sinned like a lot. But no, one sin. I always use this illustration because I think it's a good one. How many cars do you have to steal to be considered a car thief? I guarantee you the police thinks it's one, okay? You might, I, I'm not really a car thief. I just stole this one because it was a Mercedes, and I don't have a Mercedes, not like that. And I just stole this one. No, no. You know how many sins you got to sin to be a sinner? One. You're a sinner. You are a sinner. And you're going to go to hell forever and ever. But Jesus, because, are, are you amazed by this? He is God himself in human flesh. And he is God, he is man, he's God and he's man. He, as God, he paid an infinite penalty on the, on the cross of Calvary. And your sins and my sins. He did it for man, which he is. 
Hallelujah. For we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews it's a scandal. How could the Messiah die? You're stupid, Paul. And to the Greeks it's just plain foolishness. One of the most famous pieces of art <coughs> in all of Roman history is a cross. And there's this Greek guy. I, I, always, I think it's Alexandrus, but I always forget the bottom of it. But this artist drew this that's been around for over 2,000 years. And, and, and this, this guy is bowing down before the cross. And it says, uh, Alexander, so whatever, is worshiping his God. And there they have a donkey hanging on the cross. That's how foolish everybody thinks we are, that we would worship a man on the cross. So I started thinking about that. What if I started singing this morning? There's room in the gas chamber for you. Come on in the gas chamber today. You say, Dad, you're a stupid person. That's how stupid it is when we preach the cross of Jesus to unbelievers. The cross. We've made it clean. we got my beautiful cross right here on the communion table. People wear a cross, earrings and, and necklaces and jewelry and tattoos and all these things. But the cross is a filthy thing. A filthy thing. I love that old song we sing. The old rugged cross, an emblem of suffering and shame. He shed, they hung Christ on the cross naked. I know in all of our pictures we died, but no one was crucified with clothes on. They stripped him down naked and beat him and hung him on the cross. The cross, sometimes the Romans would crucify over a thousand people at one time and put them up on the Apian Way if there was a rebellion. You know how long it takes to die on a cross? No one died faster than two to three days. One person lasted 23 days hanging on the cross. You're struggling for breath. At night, animals start coming out and eating your flesh off of you. Can you imagine parts of your body start dying even while you're hanging there? Average was about 13 days to die on the cross. Jesus died more quickly. And even, even the two that were with him, remember they broke their legs so that they could die faster. But when they went to break Jesus' legs, they saw that he was already dead. They shoved a spear into his side to prove it and not take blood and water. And even Pilate said, well, I'm amazed that he died so fast. In six hours on the cross, he paid an eternal punishment for your sins and for my sins. But we've glorified the cross. We've cleaned it up. But the cross is foolishness to the, to the Greek. It's stumbling block to the Jews. But to them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. He is the power of God is the cross. That filthy piece of wood stained by the blood of the Savior. No doubt they used that same cross again for another person they thought was worthy to die. But you know what? They hung him on the cross. And he was unlike any other person that's ever died. He was sinless. They buried him and death could not hold him. Verse 25. Because the foolishness of the cross is wider than men. And the weakness is stronger than men. Nothing. There's no other way. The cross. And he called us. I want to just look at one word or two here. He called us. Verse 24. You've been called by God. Answer that call and be saved today. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus died for all mankind. I don't care what other people preach in, in, in McDowell County and other places around the world that Jesus only died for the elect. He died for everybody. So that you don't have to die and go to hell. No matter how filthy you are, you don't have to die and go to hell. He'll wash your sins away today. Hallelujah. It says, for His good pleasure that He did. We covered that. And the climax of it all is in verse 25. The cross. The cross. There's no other way. The only hope for your lost family, the only way your husband, your wife, your children are not going to die and go to hell is that bloody cross of Jesus Christ. The cross. The empty tomb. You need to repent. Follow him. Number four. Next to the end of the chapter. God's wisdom has a purpose. <laughs> let, let me read just a few of these verses. I don't know how far we'll go. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll read it off. For you, see, for you see your calling brethren. He's talking to all those church Christians there in Corinth. But he can also be talking to the Christians in Jaeger. For you see your calling brethren. How that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now, he didn't say not any, did he? I hope you look at my little outline. He said not many, okay? But God has chosen us. I want you to get that in your mind. Well, it's three times he says not many, but then he says, uh, three times he says chosen. 
But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. The word confound is, a, is another uh, 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 legal word. It means, it means to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to convince those that won't believe. Okay? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like if, a, if you're a lawyer standing for you, he wants to confound the other side. Okay? He wants to give proof. Okay? It's, it's, that's a good word, proof. They can have proof of things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and those which are despised hath God chosen. God chose those things. Yay! And the things that are not to bring to naught nothing the things that are. Okay, so. Alright, so. The wisdom of God has a purpose. So he's going from preaching the blood of the cross, what it accomplishes more than man's wisdom, to go to the calling of the lowly instead of the calling of the noble. All right. I, I think this you might be able to, if you're cocky today, this verse 26 is for you, okay? For you see your calling, brethren. He didn't call me any wise. Look around here. I've often said this, and some of y'all get mad when I say, but I still say it because I don't care what you think. I say, come out there. I invite people to Calvary Baptist Church. They say, I won't fit. I say, it's the worst bunch of people you ever met. <laughs> they were, they're terrible. Jesus had to save them because they were everyone going to hell. Amen. They're everyone miserable sinners, including the pastor and the assistant pastor and the associate. <laughs> All of us are going to hell, but Jesus saved us from hell. You think you won't fit? You, there ain't nobody too bad to come to this church, I guarantee you. Not when you knew what some of these people used to be. Not when you knew what I used to be. My goodness. God, look around, brother. He didn't choose the wise and the mighty and the noble. <laughs> the wise after the flesh. Now, I know he didn't say, didn't choose any. If you say, well, but I, maybe I, Paul was one of the not many because Paul was educated. He was a Roman citizen. Paul was everything. Paul was... Paul was just one of those unbelievable geniuses of the world. Even in secular history, the Apostle Paul, it's not called Paul, it's called Saul, was, was a man that was very admired in, in society. But let me tell you what. Yeah, there's some mighty, and I'm glad. I'm glad there's some billionaires that get saved and God uses them to bless and build hospitals and build Bible colleges and stuff. But you know who mostly saves? You, me. The little nobodies, the little cogs that makes the that makes the work go on. We're just a little cog. We're nobodies. We're nothings. But God saved us for His own good pleasure. Don't forget that. In fact, it says three times we were chosen. So, and the noble, literally the word, if you have a different translation, may, may translate, it's the word well-born. Okay? The well-born. Not many of the well-born are called, but some were. We're going to read about how some in Herod's house were saved. Some in Caesar's household were saved. I'm still, you know, there's some that's being saved. But for the most part, it's not us. We're not mighty. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He did it just to confuse the wise. And He's chosen the weak things to confuse the things that are mighty. And He's chosen the base things of the world and the things that are despised. Hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, the things which are nobodies. In fact, I think Paul is purposely not personalizing it because he's saying things as to the people, but it's really people. The people that are not, to bring to not. Now, that's a King James word. And it amazes me sometimes because I'll ask people, I asked someone not long ago, uh, do you know what ought means? Do you know what not means? No. Well, because they're not, it's an old, old word, okay? It means nothing. It's further, to say to a Greek, nothing. To say you're nothing was the worst insult you could ever give any Greek citizen. The Romans may not become one to punch you in the face, but you say this to a Greek in Corinth, they'll punch you in the face. Because I am somebody, that's what they all thought. So that sounds very American. You, you do know we get our democracy from Greek democracy. No? That's why we're so, that's why I like Corinthians so much, because it's just like reading about modern day America. It's like reading about us today. Yeah, you're nothing, but God can save you. Why did he do this? Here's his purpose. Why did, why, did, why did Christ die? Wisdom has a purpose. That no flesh should glory in His presence. He saved us. There's a new song. I, I, I say new, newer than the hymns we sung this morning. Uh, I can't remember the title of it now. 
uh, oh, how deep the Father's, how great the Father's love for me, or how deep the Father's love for me. I love that song. It's a very, it's like our old hymn, just very scriptural. You know what? But, you know, we're nothing. And then the blood of Jesus saves us and makes us somebody in God's kingdom. That no flesh, if you want to really, I, I wish I had time this morning, we'd read all of Revelation chapter 4 and 5. It'll take you less than five minutes, even if you're a slow reader like me. But you could spend 12 or 13 hours there just reading the glory, the worship of God. You say, I get bored singing these same old songs. Do you now? <laughs> Do you? In heaven forever and ever. It's been going on already for thousands of years. The beasts are crying this out. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And it never stops. And every time they say it, they see a different facet of God because God is eternal. And they're blown away again. And they say it again. My God, I can sing how great they are forever and ever. I can Amen. sing these old songs over and over. I can sing page 19. Nothing but the blood come wash away. Over and over again. Man, if you're bored, the answer is Jesus. <laughs> the answer is Jesus. But of Him are you in Christ Jesus, we are in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You think Paul didn't get excited? My, he's all fired up, isn't he? Wisdom. All the wisdom of God put into us by the power of God. Wisdom. All this wisdom. I say I made a little note here about, about these four words real fast. The wisdom. Wisdom, the knowledge of God. Righteousness, because you can preach for months on these. Righteousness just means a right standing with God. Sanctification means the holy is set apart uh, through God. Redemption, being paid for, bought back by God, by the cross, all for the glory of God. That it, that, according as it is written, I, Paul just loves saying, I love the Bible. He said, Jeremiah chapter 9, He that glorieth, yes, let him glory. In the Lord. Okay, all right. I know I said there's only four points, but I feel bad because I'm going to do one more. This will take just a minute. I want us to go through verse 5. Because all verse 1 through 5 is, is just a summary of what he just said. So, this is a, Paul's, and it's not just, it's a, it's a beautiful summary because Paul said, remember when I was with you two years ago. So it's a summary, but it's vivid in their mind, their imagination. As he says this to them. This is Paul's personal experience with them summarizing these four things we just covered. That God's word is enduring. God, I mean, God's power of the cross is enduring. It has a purpose. It's power. It's always about the cross. It's power. It's enduring. It's the testimony of God. Verse 4, uh, uh, not with enticing words, the power of God that your faith should not stand. That is, it's enduring forever. But in the power of God, all these things. So let's just, just read it. And we'll go through it as we go. It won't take but just about two or three minutes. And I, brother, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech. Sounds like verse 18 does, 17 and 18. Or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. I didn't come to, with wisdom, but I came declaring. Do you think that's amazing? The testimony of God. God's own witness. God has a witness. I love to hear you guys testify. I'll let the redeemed of the Lord say so. But this is God's testimony, God's witness. I didn't come with tricks of the trained orator, as I said earlier. I just came with God's own witness. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's always Paul's method. He's only there just to preach the cross. As filthy as people is, they lock him in prison, they beat him, they laugh at him, everything else, because he preaches, the way to heaven is by the cross of Jesus Christ. The way to heaven is through a dead Savior, but a living Lord. Are you with me? Amen. He died as our Savior, he rose as our Lord. Hallelujah. Always Paul's method. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. I, I should not talk about the because his fear of being removed when he first got there. Remember, uh, God came to him in a vision. We saw this last week in Acts chapter 18. He said, don't be afraid, Paul. Preach the word. I have many people here. Here's the way. Paul uses this little phrase, fear and trembling. It always means this. It's an urgent issue. Come to Christ and repent in fear and trembling. It doesn't mean you have to be shaken, but it means it's urgent. He says, I came preaching Jesus Christ 
in weakness, not in my power, in fear and trembling. Very urgent that I get this across to you. That my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration. Here's another legal term. It was in legal proof. It's the opposite of, of, of over here where it's confounded. You confound your opposition, then you demonstrate the power. You, know, you demonstrate why you're right. But in the demonstration of His power? No, 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 no. Of the Spirit and power and of power. He came in the power of Almighty God. You want to preach Jesus Christ? It's not how smart you are. It's not how many degrees you've got. It's not how intelligent you are. It's all just about Jesus. It's just about Jesus. You say, but I've been saved but two months. If you've been saved one minute, you're qualified. Go tell somebody what Jesus did for you. <laughs> tell them how filthy you were and Jesus washed your sins away. You don't even have to know a song to sing. All you got to know is Jesus washed your sins away by His blood. And, you can, and your friends can repent of their sins and they can be saved too. Hallelujah. Whew. And then last, that your faith should not stand in wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I do want to say this. I really feel impressed to say this. We need to know that we're saved without a doubt. Amen. The message of eternity, even in these unsure days that we live in. We live in very <coughs> unsure days. We live in the only time in history where all of mankind can be wiped out by, by bombs and things. Now, they won't be. God, God's Word teaches us. But we live in scary times. But you know what? It has been determined, proved, by the Spirit of God and by the power of God. That we can know the crucified one. He who knew no sin became sin for you. That you could know his righteousness. Well, we didn't finish this whole section about this whole second issue of their division. That goes all the way through the end of the chapter. We'll stop. We'll look at that. The Lord's willing. Uh, uh, next time we look in the first Corinthians book. But guys, we're going to have a song of invitation. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, we invite you to come. If you say, well, I'm just not sure. Don't leave here unsure. Come and pray. Or right where you stand. You don't, that six or 90 feet up here don't save you. You stand right where you are and say, Jesus, wash my sins away. Then testify to somebody. Tell somebody, I am Jesus to save me today. Because with the heart you believe, with the mouth confession is made in salvation. Romans chapter 10. Let's stand together. That's just a she will turn back to the piano. Today is your day. casket this big all the way up you better be ready to meet Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior I ask you to be seated at this time and ask the deacons if they would come and prepare the communion table